welcome to the channel. Thanks for joining me. So today we're going to take a look at the Star Force game from Grandstand all the way from the 1980s. Now this particular game I suppose came in a line of succession. We started with Astro Wars in 1981 then Scramble came along in 1982. That was followed in 83 by Firefox and then we got Star Force from 1984. So it's quite a large unit, especially compared to Astro Wars, for example. More Firefox kind of size. I guess they thought bigger was better by then. Also sports quite a few buttons. You can see the level phase and start. Some of those were quite common to other games, but we kind of got this real arcade looking and very 1980s silver, black and red colour scheme going on with a joystick there and a massive fire button for really giving those aliens a good hide in. You also had this sound on off button as well so you could play after bedtime without your parents knowing you could let those batteries burn out on you without anyone knowing that you were playing into the small hours or at least that's the uh, that's what i heard on the rumor mill so there we go it's uh it's quite in nice condition i think it's not too bad it's a little bit scuffed a little bit dirty but it's not in too bad condition overall i think it's uh it's pretty tidy it hasn't got any broken parts or chipped bits of plastic or anything like that it is pretty dirty so you can see there's sticker residue on there it's got kind of grime and it's just generally got like this patina of sticky mess and stuff all over it and uh, there she is but not in too bad condition overall it's got the original battery cover which was common in fact to the other games so these grandstand games all kind of shared the same battery cover and the contacts themselves look nice and clean inside so there's no reason in theory why this wouldn't work as long as the electronics are all tickety-boo. So we'll take a look at it in a moment, plug it in, have a look and see what happens with that. So there we go then, there's the Star Force game. There's not many of these about, as I say, it's quite a rare one. I'm not sure why the VFD or vacuum fluorescent displays were still quite prevalent at the time and still quite successful. And this had quite a nice big flat screen to it and it was quite a, a decent size and quite a nice looking game with lots of different phases and plenty of colours going on in there. But for some reason, I'm not sure if it was because not so many were produced or maybe they just got lost or damaged more, I don't know. But in either event, quite a rare beast. So let's take a look at it today. Okay, so the first thing we'll do then is get some batteries in. And then we'll also try it on the mains. And we'll power it up. So let's see what happens now. Okay, that's working nicely. There we go. So we've got screen, we've got sound. Happy days, right, level. Okay, the L1 isn't changing readily. Ah, there we go. Got pressed down fairly hard on that. Ditto for the phase button. Have to press down fairly hard on that to make that work. Might be a design thing, but you never know. Start. Oh. Okay, so. Go. I'm trying to just turn the sound off a minute. I'm trying to just ascertain just how, yeah, it feels like the left is dragging quite a bit. So the fire button seems to be working, but the left hand, yeah, it's loosening up a tiny bit, but it still feels like the left, the left hand is dragging. So it's firing okay. The right hand side movement is okay but the left seems to be dragging a bit so we'll clean the contacts anyway and let me just turn the power off right so we'll get the batteries out and just try it with the mains power just to check that the uh, dc power is okay okay so now we'll put in six volts negative polarity and power it back up again Okay, so, oh, oh, hang on, oh, hang on. 
Yeah. Oh, hang on. Oh. Okay, so if I hold it there, it's okay. And start. Oh, see that? As soon as I... Oh, I don't want to do that because I don't want to damage the internals. But basically, every time I nudge the power supply there, it goes off and starts again. So, we've got a situation then, by the looks of it, where it's running nicely off batteries. The power is getting through to the, uh, to the actual unit from the mains. But the contact's obviously loose, dirty, bent, broken, or a combination of the above. So, in summary then, what we need to do is basically strip it down, take the contacts apart, clean the internals, review the performance of the DC connector jack, and possibly replace that, and just get everything a nice deep clean, get rid of this sticker residue, and basically clean the dirt out of the nooks and crannies, give it a nice polish. And that should be all we need to do. So, first things first then, let's get it open. And to that end, I'm bringing out the Towel of Destiny. So we'll put that down there. And uh, start opening her up. So I think there are six screws altogether. Okay, six identical screws and I'm not sure how this one opens up the firefox you've actually got to take the small cap off to access the screw to take the joystick off before you can lift the top part clear but this one ah much better design okay so we'll come back to the base in a moment but as far as the top's concerned we've basically got the screen we've got the screen fitted there and then we've got the little backdrop with the uh, the space diagram mounted in there very similar to to the other games in the series so that's okay and there are no cracks or anything major any lifting paint or anything like that so that's all nice and clean that will actually polish it quite nicely i think and we may actually find it easier in a little while to remove the screen and in fact let's do that now let's just do that while we're here shall we so Again, very much like the other games, especially Astro Wars, this one, you've got the flange, got little flange screws just here, which hold, hold the plate in. Okay, like so. And just for reference, the print that you can feel actually faces towards the viewer and the gloss unprinted side faces to the internal part of the mechanism. So that's that. Righty-ho then. So then we've got the two screws to attach the screen. And as before, on the other games, they used exactly the same screw, so that keeps the part count down makes assembly easier and all of that so and there's no need to worry about mixing them up either but uh, there we go so the screen is held on by two screws ah okay <laughs> or one screw in this instance and this is the beauty about taking it apart is uh, you may notice there's one mounting point there the other one is there and that's because this little fella is broken fortunately the mounting stud on there isn't broken and this is going to be a case of bonding bonding this however it goes to get it the right way round basically that's got to bond back into there so that's a little job that we didn't know we needed to do but that's the beauty about getting these things apart so the screen is broken now interestingly then right okay okay good and the bad then about this screen is that on astro wars as an example the actual patterned part the magnifying part of the lens is um is a separate uh how can i put it a separate shield plastic insert that magnifies the screen 
this appears to be actually pressed into or part of the form of the screen itself so it's only one part but that does also mean that the whole thing is nice and solid actually so it means that we'll be able to get in here and give this thing a darn good polish we can give it a deep a deep cut and a polish which will get rid of those surface scratches really nicely without fear of us breaking this the fragile screen also it's a flat screen the astro wars that i keep referring to has got a curved screen so you can't replace that with plexiglass or anything because it's actually the concave part is mounted into the screen and it's got print around it this has got none of those issues so we can really get in here and, and cut this deep and polish it so that's going to be lovely obviously we'll repair it with that broken piece as well so that's a little job to do for the screen but anyway that wasn't really why we were here was it we were here to to look at the uh, at the actual control mechanisms and so to that end I'm just going to remove the three screws that hold the controls in place but to first I think I'm going to come in for a slightly better view for you okay so we're pretty much top side now and what I'm just going to do is remove the actual gel here just so that we can give this a wipe in due course you probably can't see it from there but there's actually like a film you can probably hear it a film of dust on there which although it doesn't look major at the moment if we can wipe that off and polish it up it gives us the best possible view to the vfd the screen a bit later and, and you don't get that diffuse softness as it were you get a nice richer deeper color so that's that now i could at this juncture actually remove the three screws here which would lift out and show us the access to the back of the VFD display. If we wanted to replace the power transistor or any of the diodes and stuff like that, that's all we'd need to do is remove those three screws there. However, today we don't actually need to do that. Interesting though to note the modifications compared to older models. I keep referring back to Astro Wars because that was the, kind of the original one from 1981. And that one had two screws either side of the VFD display. This one's actually got a sort of a triangle of screws. So they've, they've cut costs, if you like, to a degree there by using one less screw. However, what they have done is improved the piezo speaker attachment because rather than just being held in by, by the weight or the friction between the two parts of the casing, what they've actually done with this one is used a separate locking part for the foam and that's screwed down so that the actual speaker resonance is maintained and maximized irrespective of the fit of the top case. So that's a definite improvement. Right, I don't know why there's a feather in here and a bit of dust. It's amazing how these things find their way in, but I don't think anybody's been in here before necessarily. So let's get this, uh, let's just get this control pad out. Okay, three screws for that one. And let's see what we have. Okay. All right. So, good news really, I suppose, is that the, uh, the actual contacts look like they're in pretty decent condition. We've got some dirt and grime in here. They were at factory, lightly greased. And you'll see that. You'll see that from here, that the, the actual sliders have got grease and the factory fitted grease here obviously used to lubricate the switches for the sound on off and obviously your power on off as well but what happens with time of course is that it does attract the dust because the the dust inlet is literally just above that and you can see the pattern of dust that forms around the unit and of course that actually becomes gritty and solid and sandy and just horrible so we will give that a decent clean We'll also clean up the contacts. Now we did say, didn't we, that it was the left position that wasn't working terribly well. So that will be that pad just there. The circuit board looks in excellent condition. So I think just a bit of isopropyl alcohol, maybe a bit of paper or kitchen roll, just to polish up these contacts, clean these up. We'll also take the opportunity as well, just to peen the uh, the contacts back slightly as well on the, on these pins here because they do flatten with time and they reduce the, the spring pressure and the, the feel of the switches. So you can very gently just, just bend these back a touch just to make a nice firm contact with the switch. So we're just gonna do that now. 
And the first thing then is some IPA and the cotton bud. And it's quite rare to find really bad carbon contacts. And I don't like to work them too hard. These ones actually look really clean, to be honest. And I'll be the first to admit, there's nothing coming off of them. I'll be the first to admit, I'm not proud, that I did say the switches felt quite hard to press. Now, maybe I've confused that with actually being like new and very, very firm because the contacts look clean. There's no corrosion to speak of. And it could just genuinely be that the rubbers, I mean, these rubbers do look fantastic. They look fresh as a daisy, I've got to say. So it could just be that they need that positive, positive pressure to engage. But in any event, I am going to just clean these contact areas. You can just put a tiny little dab of grease or lube back on there if you wanted to. Ah, now that one there was quite dirty, I've got to say. But I mean, literally just a couple of square inches of cleaning there has resulted, resulted in that. So you can kind of see, you don't really want all that kind of cack in the mechanism as it were. So, but similarly, we haven't got to go mad with it either. Just want to freshen it up. So I'm going to just go ahead and just keep cleaning this, have a general dust around the insides as well. And then we'll turn our attention to the other jobs. So that's the contacts all cleaned up. I've also cleaned the switch contacts and just peeled the uh, the actual pins back slightly just for a positive engagement when we put it back together. And the contact pads are all super clean as well. So although there's no need to, one of the things I enjoy about making these videos and sharing these things with you guys is that uh, it'd be quite nice just to see what's inside these. As I say, they're quite rare and there aren't that many videos around about Star Force, so I thought it might be quite a nice reference video if nothing else just to see the insides even though there's no work to do this side of it we have of course got to do something about this uh, about the DC input jack so we'll do that while we're here of course but anyway first up then let's just take a quick a quick look at the uh, at the mech so there's your there's your cover plate. All right, so here we go then. In fact, I'm just gonna give that a gentle, very gentle dust with my finger there, just for, right, okay, so there's your coil, got a couple of caps in there, and there's your transistors. So I can't see actually, I'm just trying to, let's just try and see what the transistors are. Just give me a moment and I'll um, I'll try and make a note of what they actually are. So we've got a D471 is the power transistor, which I think is the same possibly as Caveman, possibly. Oh, it's a D882 normally. So your power transistor is a D471. And there's not an awful lot going on. You can see... You can see it's pretty neat and tidy behind there, I've got to say. Very neat and tidy. So you've got your coil there, a couple of caps dotted around. You've got your transistors just down here, and here's your screen contacts. But yeah, very neat. Look at that. Very neat and tidy. Quite weighty, I've got to say. This screen, you can tell. You can tell it's a lot bigger than some of the other games. It really is. Um, it's a lot heavier. Right, anyways, so that's that's all you've got inside there. Um, in terms of diodes, there's a couple just there. And again, yeah, they look like, like switching diodes. There's three there. Yeah, just having a look. SO5, SO6, S11. All right. But anyway, so there we go. There's the inside for anyone that's interested. That's the, uh, that's the circuit board of the... Uh, of the actual actual game and do you know what just while we're here i know i'm waffling on a bit but I'm, i've gone 
you could say off script even though i don't actually have a script but there you go so there's nothing behind there it's a single-sided printed board so i'm just going to go ahead and screw that back down but just so you could see for completeness and there we go right so the next job then is the, the power jack okay now the power jack on this one is very similar to your astro wars and that kind of thing so we should be okay to to look at this one now and the idea is if we just set the meter to continuity the idea being of course that you've got positive and negative contact here now what you should have is continuity between the two two battery contacts just there because at the moment it thinks there's batteries in there because there's no jack connected so what you do is you've got your negative there and you've got your two positives so if i just zoom in a little bit the orange and the red in this case are both technically connected and therefore when the batteries are in the, the six volts flows from the orange straight through to the red and onto the board however when you then plug in the mains so you put your six volts in here what will happen is that it then disconnects the battery circuit because obviously you don't want 12 volts running through there and you also don't want to be charging up the disposable batteries so in order to get your six volts directly in it separates these two now so there should be no continuity which is correct however you should find that you've got six volts i'll just put my just move this along a little bit i should find it's about 5.9 i think going in that we've got there we go there's the 5.9 volts going through so the power's getting through fine and that's got through to the board okay and we know that because obviously the unit itself was working it's not a problem with that per se where the problem lies and i don't know if i'm going to be able to do this i might have to get some clips in a moment for it but essentially essentially the issue comes from let me see if we can do this the issue comes from the fact that when we move it the power comes and goes there we go so we've got 5.9 and it's gone can you see that just about so if i reset it there it's about 5.9 and i'm literally just going to use my finger to tap the inlet and it's gone all right so what's happening is there's a there's a break or something's wrong inside the pin which is giving us intermittent issues now it could be anything to be honest it could be damage inside there quite often they just give out and I've, I've got to be honest with you that looks pretty clean that does look pretty clean to me doesn't look too bad and also the fact that it's getting the full voltage through to the board would tend to tell me that it's not a corrosion issue per se because otherwise you'd never be getting the voltage through the fact that it's getting through sometimes as soon as you knock it it's obviously separated or done something inside now i can also see from this that the the wires are all still nicely soldered on so it's not a mechanical issue it's not as if when we tap it we're actually dislodging a cable at this end because they are they are okay so i'm not going to mess about trying to repair bend or restore this what i'm going to do is actually just get the thing off and replace it with a new old stock equivalent okay at the risk of making myself look like a complete fool i was just going to change this because i I do actually replace these quite regularly out of necessity but when I was about to um, replace it with a brand new old stock one you can see you can see the dimensions are are identical and these do fit perfectly I noticed I've just tweaked it already but I noticed that the blade here was actually significantly flatter than it should be so I thought well just out of interest the actual pin seemed quite firm and wasn't loose 
and I thought well maybe then there is just an issue so I've done is just got a little screwdriver in there and bent this bent the sheath back out slightly to match the profile of the uh, of the new one as it were and to that extent let's just plug this in and see what happens and of course we'll need to reinstate I'm just going to zoom out we need to reinstate the uh, the original controls here so we can power it on okay and you'll see if i just put this in position uh, in fact let me just do that again there we go you can see if i press start it's absolutely fine now It's absolutely fine now. So actually, after all that messing about, <laughs> all that pontificating, as I say, I normally would just replace this because you find that there's an internal fracture somewhere and it doesn't matter what you do. Having spent a lot of time in the past trying to repair some of these, it's easier just to stick a brand new one in. However, this is one of those examples where I'm going to eat my, uh, eat my hat, humble pie, take a pick of menu and say actually i didn't need to do it on this one just needed to make sure that pin was back out where it needed to be it's just had too much wear i guess over the past and generally worn itself down or somebody might have tried perhaps the wrong adapter in there and actually forced it and bent the pin back which we've now sorted either way it's working so that's good news so the next thing we shall do i think is probably move on to polishing the screen and I say that now because it's easier to polish it, then I can glue the broken piece back on rather than uh, waiting. If I glue it, then it'll be more fragile and I'll have to wait for it all to cure before I can polish it. So let's go and clean that screen. It's also worth just keeping tabs on where we are. So I'm just running a bit of cleaning solution over the control pad. You can see the stuff that's coming off. I'll give it a proper plastic polish and shine later, but just whilst I can get to it, I'm just getting the worst of it off now. A fairly, fairly crude clean, but uh, it's a start. We can then go ahead, refit that to the unit and also refit the, uh, the internals and stuff like that and start getting that working. Okay, that's the uh, the main component part sorted. So next for the screen and to clean the top case. So here's the screen then. As I say, not in too bad a condition, but there's a piece that needs to be glued on there. And also it just needs a general, a general kind of wipe. So I'm just gonna get the worst of the dust off with a bit of a wet wipe. And uh, then we'll get some tea cut, usual trick, work that in polish it off and that'll look great and then we can bond the new piece or I should say the broken old piece back on so I've polished that pretty well now and it's just drying to a haze and then I'll be able to clean it off as you can see 
and it won't be perfect but it'll be just that little bit better than it was and there it is certainly looking a lot better than it was and i'm just going to try and super glue this piece on How well it will really work is anyone's guess, but we'll give it a go. It feels like it's in the right plane and it looks like it's in the right plane. And I must admit it's gone in perfectly. So I'm just going to Hope for the best on that one for a minute and let that cure. Be back shortly. And just while we wait for the super glue to cure, I'm going to start wiping down the uh, top case. As I say, it's not in too bad condition. The silver work is good. The decal is in really nice condition, actually. So I'm just going to really do this for two reasons. One, obviously, it gets the grime and the grit out. But two, I'll just start to soften up that label a little bit, ready to start getting some sticky stuff remover on there. And also, it'll allow us to get the polish on there without polishing his grit into it. So it's the nooks and crannies, really, that we've got to get into. And to that extent, I do tend to use something like a cocktail stick or something like that to get right into the corners. You'll find the 1980s stuff has got a lot of a lot of um, different sort of angles. Everything was very angular and aggressive looking then. And uh, it looks great visually, but it can be awkward to get into the corners to clean them all. So you just, just be methodical, just be careful, work your way through. Also things like the, uh, the vents, if I just zoom in a little bit, and here's the, the cooling vents. And you can see it's probably how dirty that is. And if I just start to, there you go. Just start to see this dirt lift lift out and it needs to be done we've got to do that on all of the all of the nooks and crannies you won't get it perfect but you certainly will make a good start on it so anyway i'm going to go and go and do that and then i'll be back with some sticky stuff remover to get that label off good stuff so that's the nooks and crannies got into now which is great and now time for the old sticky stuff remover and we'll just try a little bit. And you can see how this is already starting to work through. Obviously what we don't know, because it has been on here a while, so what we don't know is whether there'll be any discoloration underneath the paintwork or not, but in any event, I just keep wiping away with this stuff. And it'll be gone within a few minutes. Incidentally, always just check a bit of this on an inconspicuous area first to make sure you don't hurt your paintwork. And let the solvent let the solvent actually do the work be careful because you don't want to start lifting too much paint off and there we go so that's completely removed now look not too much damage at all to the paintwork just in fact off the entire off the entire cleaning process you can just see some of that metallic there a little bit so do be careful but uh, obviously it's better to lose the tiniest bit of paint than it is to have this horrible great big sticker over the face there so i think by the time this is wiped down safely and polished up it will look just the job and if i just use a baby wipe here look you'll see that actually there's no loose paint on there so that was literally just what was probably embedded in the actual sticker itself it's been on there for many many years obviously 
anyway so i'm basically just neutralizing everything now by using a little baby wipe and uh yeah next stage give it a bit of a buff get the screen in and get it all back together so now to refit the screen which i'm hopeful we will now engage on both of these contacts Now this is the one that was okay. This is the one that was broken. I'm just going to be careful with it. There we go. Nice and solid actually. That's good. Okay, then we said the print on this was to the viewer. So again, a cursory a cursory dry wipe that's fine and then that gets screwed back into place with the flange screws like so all nice and clean and restored And at this juncture, I'm just going to put a little bit of vinyl cleaner onto the actual control pad. Just to brighten it up. And we know we can't get to some of this afterwards because it will be hidden by the top casing. So just giving this a cursory clean. Now we marry the two halves together. Like so, turn it over, get the six screws in the back and give it an overall wipe of the polish. So here it is then, Grandstand Star Force, all the way from 1984. Now this particular example wasn't in the best condition, wasn't in the worst condition, kind of somewhere in the middle. It had lots of potential, it was structurally pretty solid, no major dings or anything like that. But it was looking old, it was tired, it was dusty, and we found out that uh, one of the joystick controls didn't seem to be terribly reactive, and I don't think it had been apart before for a service. Once we got it apart, we found that the screen was actually cracked. One of the mounting points had broken away as well. It was just generally a bit dusty and dirty in there. Furthermore, once we powered it up, it worked fine from batteries, but there was a very intermittent issue with the inlet jack for the power for the DC. So it kept coming on and off as soon as you breathed anywhere near the input socket. So what did we do? Well, basically just giving it a deep clean for a start, polished the scratches out of the screen, which is great. Taking it apart, we've stripped down the contacts, cleaned those carbon contacts and hopefully restored the proper function to the joystick. Yet to be tested, we'll do that in a second. We've also actually manipulated the original power jack, which we could have replaced easily enough. But we think now that actually we think this is going to work just nicely. So we'll try that as well in a second. And yeah, just basically giving it a good overhaul and really giving it a new lease of life ready for years ahead. So with that in mind, let's turn this on now. And if you see any flickering there, that's not there in real life. That's just a shutter speed thing. But if we actually move this around from the jack socket, you can see that actually it's working fine now. It's not intermittent like it was before. So we didn't need to replace it in the end. We've just moved the contact back and sorted that, which is great news. But yeah, she's working nicely as far as we can tell. So I'm just going to dim the light a little bit and press start here. Let's see if this nice music. We'll see if the joystick's working. And yep, right and left, right, left, right, 
left, nice, look at that now. Yeah, that ship's working beautifully now. Fabulous, good stuff. So what do we know? Basically, we've given it a good clean, polished the screen, cleaned the internals, wiped down the VFD screen, sorted out the power jack, cleaned the contacts, sorted out the joystick and the button reactiveness, and just generally giving it a deep clean and a polish. So there it is then, Grandstand's Star Force from 1984. Hope you enjoyed the video. There's not many about on this particular unit, so hopefully that's a nice chance for you to see inside one of these and see what you're up against. Very similar in many respects to a lot of the other Grandstand and indeed other VFD games of its time. But nonetheless, there you go. Hope you find that a useful reference video, if nothing else. In the meantime, thanks very much for watching and please do check out the rest of the channel. And consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell for updates on games. We've got loads of boom boxes, personal stereos, 8-track stuff, all kinds of cool old stuff. So it'd be great to have you along for the ride. Thank you to those that do support the channel and I'll see you all soon. All the best for now. Bye bye.